quick question for you all. How can the hidden depths of our oceans hold the key to tackling climate change? Well, today we're going to dive deep into this very question, and there's some exciting stats around this as well. And my guest today is at the forefront of this very mission. His name's Robert Huddenbeck, and he's the Global Director for Climate and Nature at a company called Fugro. And we're going to talk about the crucial role that geodata plays in understanding and preserving our planet's most vital ecosystem. With 60 years of expertise and a global team of 12,000 people, Fugro has been instrumental in collecting and analysing comprehensive geodata that supports industries across the world. But now they're turning their focus towards one of the most pressing challenges of our time, climate change, particularly in ocean environments. Now, despite covering 70% of our planet, only 25% of the ocean has actually been mapped. How mind-boggling is that stat alone? And I think this leaves a significant gap in our understanding of these critical areas. We're all looking up to the skies and exploring to Mars and beyond, but the fact that only 25% of our planet, of our oceans are mapped and that they take up 70% of our planet, I must admit I struggle to get my head around that fact. So today, Robert is going to share his insights into how Fugro is addressing this knowledge gap and why it's essential for global climate science. And we'll also discuss the importance of public-private partnerships in scaling these efforts and learning more about how data sharing can accelerate solutions to the environmental challenges that we face. But what does it take to balance commercial objectives with environmental stewardship? So as we navigate through these complex topics, we will also uncover how technological innovations like geodata, like AI and machine learning, are collectively shaping the future of ocean health and climate resilience. And find out if we really are doing enough to protect the unseen realms of our planet and what more can be done. Reaching listeners in 165 countries every day is, is testament to the unwavering support of you, my listeners, and our sponsors, without whom this podcast just simply wouldn't be possible. And it also gives me a chance to talk about the fact that Legacy DRM failed to securely enable external collaboration, especially on sensitive files, and how every organisation faces this risk-trust contradiction where they can share content with untrusted third parties yet expected to protect that data. So it's time for something more modern, a DRM solution that solves that dilemma without compromising security or productivity. And you can do all that with a company called KiteWorks that will enable you to say goodbye to deployment headaches, file transfer risks, collaboration barriers and productivity constraints. So you can experience a more modern way to collaborate on sensitive content without sacrificing control or security. Please visit KiteWorks.com to get started today. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. Now is the moment you've really been waiting for. It's time to get today's guest on. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Thanks, Neil, and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm uh, Robert uh, Holdenbach. I'm uh, the Global Director for Climate and Nature for Fugro. Uh, Fugro is a geodata company, um, which means uh, when, when you build something, you design something, you maintain something on the earth, uh, we provide the data uh, to do that in a safe and sustainable uh, manner. So that's geotechnical data, geophysical, geodetic data, everything that pertains to the surface and the subsurface of the earth, uh, both on the uh, on the on the land and the seaside. Um, building offshore wind farms, high speed rails or nuclear plants. And and nowadays we do that with twelve thousand people and we've been uh, yeah, building up our expertise in technology over the last six years. Um, we are also a company in transition, um, decades of, of mapping the oceans. Uh, we also see now the opportunity and the contribution that we can uh, deliver to uh, climate and nature related applications of our expertise. Um, but there we're focused mostly on, on water. So that's about flooding, coastal resilience, ocean health. That's where our strength lies. And may, maybe personal, um, I'm, I'm a map maker by trade. Uh, I've led map making businesses uh, for the last uh, uh, two decades to support energy transition, but now also the adaptation to climate change. And if I look at my first projects, which were uh, 23 years ago in the ocean, I, I really saw firsthand 
uh, how we map maker supply or or uh, knowledge uh, really to explore but also to exploit nature and I, I think in in those days certainly nature was an obstacle for progress um and if if you look at it now we came a long way uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that that Fugro and, and myself as well can really put our technology to global challenges like climate change or nature preservation. And one of the reasons I was excited to get you on the podcast today is when I was doing a little research on you guys, what on you guys, what put you on my radar was that you were at the forefront of geodata collection and analysis. But I'm, I'm curious, how is this data being utilized to address things like climate change? And, and what role do you see it playing in that? broader fight against environmental degradation yeah great good question and then uh, as said i mean we, we've been around for quite a long time uh, we were founded in 1962 as, as a dutch engineering firm uh very very uh soon already or early already focusing on water management uh, as the dutch are are famous uh, for and i think in, in climate change in, in general what, what you see is that uh, we do understand it on a high conceptual level um, but when it's about, for example, oceans, so there's there's still a lot to understand about the interdependencies of, of climate, nature, uh, heat absorption, CO2, uh, sequestration, currents, all those different systems. And and the importance of geodata, uh, understanding depths in the ocean or understanding currents or ocean parameters in general or how coastlines change uh, cannot be underestimated. Um you, you see over the years, uh, satellite imagery uh, and, and data in general has become very much important uh, for, for answering that question. But it's multi-skill. So to, to be able to, to, to mitigate and adapt to climate change locally, uh, you need very high quality information to inform decision making and engineering. And we've been doing that for, for a long time. We've been doing that mostly to support uh, uh, the, the planning and build and then maintain ma- maintenance of, uh, of uh, infrastructure. But in doing that, uh, we geared up a lot of knowledge around uh, the natural environment, and that's that's what we are currently applying uh, to to full skill. And I love a good start on this podcast. And despite the majority of the world being uh, underwater, I think, and despite significant advances in technology, only twenty five percent of the ocean has actually been mapped, which is just astounding. What, what challenges are, do you see associated with ocean mapping and someone right in the heart of this space? And how are you overcoming these obstacles? Because we keep talking about exploring space, but there's so much that's unexplored and unknown right here on Earth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah and exactly. And uh, people people typically do make that link uh, to space and to Mars and the fact that, that the oceans are less mapped than Mars is, actually. Um, yeah. And uh, if you, if you, as you go to conferences, you see a lot of ocean experts. Uh, they, they lament uh, the fact that, that there's a lack of, there seems to be a lack of interest for oceans. And I think to a degree that's at the heart of the problem. Um, another underappreciation of, of the importance uh, of, of, of oceans in general for us as humankind. Um, but also specifically to, to, to the problems of climate change and, 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 and nature preservations. Um, funny thing is, I mean, uh, we're, we're, uh, we might be interested to find Martians on Mars, uh, but actually the real aliens are, are in the, in the depths of the oceans. And then we, we, we know so little about them and about their role they play in, in our ecosystem. So what, what, what we do appreciate though uh, more and more i think is that uh, our planetary challenges are linked to the ocean um the solutions actually lie there as well and what we do know and just to run a few stats 90 uh, percent uh, of the heat uh, is is being absorbed by the oceans uh, 25 to 30 percent approximately of, of co2 is being sequestered uh, by the oceans but with that also uh, new problems arise and 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 um, so it's a solution on the one hand the ocean is 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 actually a buffer for for the problems that that are created uh, but but it also becomes a problem in itself 90 uh, percent of our ecosystem is in the oceans and actually that that ecosystem seems to be harmed by the fact that, uh, that that the oceans are warming, for example. Um, and to understand this, um, have we, we, I think we, and, and to use responsibly the ocean uh, as a resource, uh, we need to understand more of the ocean. We need to map more of the ocean uh, in, in all parameters. Eh? If it's, it's about really the mapping of the ocean floor or the constitution or the, the, the parameters in the ocean, um, that it's important. 
to uh, to uh, to keep using the ocean as a resource. And um, I think approximately three billion people in the world are dependent on the oceans. And I, I understood that twenty percent of our protein is coming via our aquaculture or fisheries. So so. Those are reasons why why we need to to understand, to care for, and to make sure that that we use the ocean in a sustainable manner. Well, more mundane uh, uh, reasons are, for example, uh, the uh, the onset of uh, of AI and and obviously the need for more more internet traffic or more more data traffic in general means very practically you need more cables. Uh, and you need to lay those cables. You need to understand that if you don't, or if you're not laying those cables over uh, a full game, like a uh, sea mount that is as big as uh, the Mount Everest. So, so those are the more mundane questions that we're answering by mapping the full ocean. And something I think we've got to talk about as well is the sharing of privately owned uh, science data is often a very sensitive topic throughout the community. So what are the key barriers to data sharing and how can the industry move towards a maybe a more open access to to benefit global environmental efforts yeah maybe maybe just just to roll back that question a little bit is, yeah. is, i think it's important to understand also why uh, it's it's important in 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 general conceptually to share data and, and what you see is that we 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 live in a, in a highly specialized world um but the problems that we're addressing actually they're asking for many different disciplines but, and both for specialization, but also for a holistic overview. And fundamentally, you have to share information and knowledge and expertise to be able to, to deal with that. And I, I think if you look at traditional industries, also the industries that we traditionally have worked in, and I worked in personally, it, it, it has always been relatively transactional. Uh, there, there was quite clear what what a client or, or, or a problem holder would need, and we would deliver that. Whereas here, it's not always clear what the problem is. We're still explore, exploring that. So so sharing is important, and Figro has been doing that for quite a bit of time. And, and maybe a nice anecdote is that that, that we were uh, the first party searching for the MH370, uh, uh, I, I think more than a decade ago now, um, in in the Indian Ocean, and we covered by searching for it, and unfortunately not finding it, 120,000 square kilometers of seafloor, and one of the most yeah extreme terrains possibly. Uh, it would be yeah, you could consider that like an inverted Himalaya, Himalayas. Um, the data did not go to waste, as the data was 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 actually uh, given to uh, uh, a foundation called Seabed 2030 that is uh, focused on on uh, mapping the ocean uh, before uh, 2030. So we're a contributor to that. So we contributed that data. It was actually the start of it. And after that, we started contributing data in transit of our vessels. Um, and and we started also uh, getting involved with the with the ocean decades for, for, for ocean science. This is a UNESCO IOC initiative. Uh, where uh, uh, they're trying to to, uh, to to build all kinds of initiatives for academics to work together. And we are contributing to the data coordination group, really focus on getting private partners to contribute their data, to share their data uh, with, uh, with the uh, academic community. Because a lot of data, certainly pertaining to the oceans, has been held... Uh, by private companies, um, and 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 yeah, this is their 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 chance to to actually contribute to to the large societal issues that we're dealing with. And public private partnerships are increasingly being seen as vital in addressing these global challenges. Is there anything else you can share around the importance of those collaborations in your work? And you're probably unable to share any uh, names or anything, but are there any examples of successful partnerships that you've been involved in that you're able to to discuss today? Yeah, I, I, I can. Um, so, first of all, I, I think PPP, you know, so public-private partnerships. Um, I always thought it was quite a boring topic, and then I, I became actually it became one of my favorite topics. And then it has to do with, with with what I said earlier. How before business was quite transactional, whereas if you look at at the type of challenges we're trying to deal with here, um, adaptation to climate change or the preservation of nature. Um, it, it it actually asks for that sharing of data, but it also asks for 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 that collaboration. And I think what what we learned in Figaro as well is how important it is to take a holistic view, to take initiatives, to bring groups together, and and to eventually um, uh, look at the interests of of the different stakeholders 
involved. And then I think they call it something like like quadruple helix, where um, hey, you take um, the governmental sector, you take uh, NGOs uh, representing the civil civil interest, you take academics, you take the private sector together, and you look at a problem and you look at each other's. Uh, objectives that you have for the problem, where uh, governments also obviously want to make sure uh, that there's a fair distribution to, to the to, to the public of, of information that's being gathered. Uh, there's regulation being set up and policies being set up. Academics they want to push their fundamental research and, and further their fundamental research. And I think what is extremely important that's the story I tell a lot at conferences is what the private sector can bring. So when you look at 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 uh, dealing with with these kind of uh, uh, big challenges, um, it's extremely important that you that you find a way to to uh, to deploy technology at scale to replicate it, and this is how you create impact. And this is specifically where where the private sector is good at, and this is what we bring uh, to the table. And I think examples of of of, of successful public private partnerships. Our, uh, our projects that we do where we were able to, to, to build scope together with our clients or with a, the dif- different uh, stakeholders, uh, then obviously go through a procurement process and, and, and eventually uh, were able to, to execute the work. One example uh, I, can, I can talk about is a project that we're currently executing uh, around uh, Italy, uh, where uh, the Italian government uh, took to quite a bold decision to allocate 400 million to understand their full ecosystem in their coastal zone. And the reason why they spent that much money is because they, they appreciate and understand the importance of, uh, of, of mapping that coastal zone for their blue economy, for their fisheries, for their tourism, for the protection of their coast, uh, for the protection of their environment. And that with that environment, they will lose out on a lot of economic uh, benefits. So this is where you see um, actually economic sustained mechanisms meeting uh, climate and, and, and nature uh, related uh, related topics. Um, and that's a great example where we were able to, or we are able to deploy uh, the, the, the cutting edge technology that we have to, to map, model and monitor uh, the, the environment. And then over time, uh, let let the Italian institutions make informed decisions about their future. And with the Earth's surface and indeed subsurface environments being critical to so many different industries, I'm curious, how do you uh, grow, ensure that that data is collected, but ultimately used to pr- promote sustainability and indeed safety through those sectors? Anything you can share around that too? Yeah, so, so we are geodata experts. In, in principle, we apply our technologies and our services to, to a very broad range of, of services. Um, and I think I think in the past, what you saw, uh, and I'm talking about 15 years ago, a lot of the demand was actually coming from, uh, from uh, uh, the fossil fuel industry. And I think what, what we've seen changing over time is that that the demand is moving towards uh, where where we really want to work? And so this is in the energy transition towards offshore wind farms. It's it's in climate and nature. This in sustainable infrastructure. And what we see is that that our clients and and the different stakeholders involved are are getting more conscious about it. And also regulation is getting better. So in that sense, we are contributing, but we're also riding the wave. Uh, of sus- of sustainability, we we have in our company we have uh, uh, quite a clear uh, uh, policy of of looking at dilemmas uh, things like, for example, deep sea mining. How do you deal with that? I mean, we would have we would have technologies to support that, but do we want to support that? So we are thinking through this. Uh, while we're also realistic about the fact that that uh, uh, as a company you need to uh, to to support the energy transition in uh, in all its facets. And given the urgency of climate change and everything that we're talking about here, are there any other technological innovations that you see that are most promising on accelerating the collection and analysis of geo geo data to inform better decision making? We hear a lot of data driven decision making inside businesses, but It'd be great to hear more about something that could actually make a huge impact on the the planet, the way we all share our home. Yeah, yeah, of course, and and, and I think I think the it starts with with making sure that you collect the the right data. And what you see, obviously, is that that we traditionally as well we collect a lot of data, and then then you quite quickly get into 
how do you extract insights from the data um, and and the use of of the AI, machine learning, uh, deep learning uh, has been part and parcel of what we've been doing for the last ten years, uh, um, um, and and uh, we've we've elaborated on that, and we've became quite uh, proficient in in making sure that we get the right insights out of out of the fast data that we acquire. So there's there's that element of it. There's the element of making sure that um, that you are able to fuse and combine different data sources, so you're not um, uh, looking at problems in tunnel fishing, but you really look at the broad spectrum of technology that you can use. Uh, and we have a very broad spectrum, eh? so it could be from 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 hyperspectral to uh, to 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 uh, to imagery to to lidar to all kinds of technology. And we're we're agnostic in that sense because we have such such a big portfolio. And when we don't have it, we will not uh, um, pigeonhole it to free services, but we will look at partners and we will work with partners to find the right right uh, solution so so on the one hand it's about just the crunching of data it's about the fusion of data which is extremely important to get the most the synergies out of different data sources um, and that that goes a lot with in collaboration also with with academics but then probably most important is not a technology uh, element uh, is it's more about really understanding w- what kind of insights do you need to get from from that geodata and we are at just just to be honest we're geodata experts so we don't we're not climate experts or we're not infrastructural experts obviously we employ those but in general we are focused on the geodata so we need to work together to really understand uh, what what these problem holders are the people that that really uh, make the decisions or, or or get the data to eventually engineer something need and one of the things I love about what you're doing here is this emphasis on building a safer and more livable world. And I'm curious, how do you balance commercial objectives with that imperative to protect and preserve our planet, particularly in, let's say, marina environments? Yeah, I, I think it's not, a, it's not a dilemma, it's not a challenge. And this is really yeah. the concept of, of of creating shared value, as they call it. This is really looking at what, what are the interests um, and what what it's more it's it's a it's a redefinition of what value is, and value is not only shareholder value. Value comes from from multiple sources, from multiple actors uh, uh, around the project that we execute. And uh, I think what we what, what we're trying broadly in the company to to really look at all those actors and make sure that that all actors involved do get the value out of it. And that 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 that's really that 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 change from transactional to a more uh um how do you say that uh, long-term engagement with 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 your clients because on the long term hey if you make sure that your clients and uh and the other stakeholders get value out of it you will get return on business um and 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 that's what we're after eventually i mean we're not i'm not defying the fact that we need to make profit and we need to make money and we will but we will do it in a way that everyone or at least the, the main actors benefit from it so looking ahead, what do you think are the, the most pressing geodata needs to support the health of our oceans? And how are you and your expertise contributing to meeting some of these challenges? Yeah, so, so what you see is that, uh, that, that if it, it, so obviously my title and then what I'm focusing on is climate and nature, because you see that that's very much linked to the climate question is 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 the natural question, and when you talk about, for example, adaptation to climate change, for example, of the coast where forty percent of of the people live near to and is most vulnerable, I think of our of our habitats. Um, you you look at typically at nature based solutions, and then you look at the quality of those nature based solutions. You look at mangroves, you look at seagrass, um, and uh, and we 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 need to make sure that um, actually we understand the the, the variables to uh, mitigate climate change. But that's relatively simple. It's quite dimensional. It's uh, CO2 is quite a simple uh, a parameter. But then if you look at biodiversity, it becomes extremely complex. What is good biodiversity? I, I, I can't say that, but there's so many parameters that you put map and measure and monitor. And I think we're, we're I know we're scratching the surface. So what we're looking for from a technology point of view is better ways to map at scale. And and you already see a lot of technology that can do it in detail, for example, with divers. And when you look at reefs or you look at, at, at biodiversity subsurface, 
uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, on the water. Um, but my, our question is always, how do we scale it? How do we create impact? Because a diver is nice for a small area, but, but you can't scale it to a full marine protected area. So that's what we're looking at. So scaling technology is one of, of the, of the things that we're focusing on, but also finding new ways to sense, um, uh, the quality, uh, of, of, of biodiversity. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on today and sharing your insights. But before I let you go, I want to have a little fun with you now and see if you can leave one final gift for everyone listening. And that's contribute a song to our Spotify playlist. I don't mind what you add. Guilty pleasures are allowed. But what would you like to add and why? Yeah, so so I, I, I thought about that. And, and uh, so over the weekend, uh, Nick Cave uh, and the Bad Seeds, they uh, released their new album, Wild God. Which is highly recommended, and and typically you would say uh, Nick Cave is a bit on the the more depressing side of the spectrum in 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 his kind of music, but you you do see that uh, there's quite some joy actually uh, uh, cycling through his his music and this this album. And I think it's a good metaphor for for what we're dealing with with climate change. I mean, there's a lot of gloom and doom, but then if you look at the uh, at the effort that a lot of people are putting into it, the technology that's applied. The scalability of the technology actually there there is there is a silver lining there there is light on the horizon and and uh, and yeah listening to uh, Nick Cave uh, in general is just a good uh, good uh, uh, use of your time. And what's the standout track from that album for you? I I think actually the the title track Wild God that has been yeah. circling around already for a few uh, few months is is excellent. But there there's plenty more uh, nuggets in there. Yeah, there really is. I'll get that added to our Spotify playlist. And for anybody listening, just wanting to find out more about everything we talked about today and your work, maybe if they want to contact you or your team, where would you like to point everyone listening? Please link to us on on, on, uh, on LinkedIn. Obviously, uh, that's where we will have the most uh, the most uh, media outlets for for what we're doing. So, so please link to us. Well, so much we covered there in 30 minutes from the role of geodata in the fight against climate change, the need to acquire more de- ocean data, with the sea only being around 25% mapped, which is just a phenomenal stat, and also the important role of public-private partnerships and technology that together can better protect our planet. So many big talking points. Love to hear what the listeners think of this one, but uh, more than anything, just thank you for bringing this conversation to life today. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for having me. Now, as we close today's episode, I think I'm left with this profound understanding of the ocean's role in our climate and also the vast opportunities that lie in mapping it and protecting it. And my guest today illuminated the crucial need for geodata in addressing climate change, particularly in areas that are still largely unexplored. And I think Robert's insights into balancing commercial success with environmental responsibility almost offer a blueprint for how companies can contribute to societal challenges, all while achieving their own goals. And the technologies driving these advancements, from AI to data fusion, are opening up new frontiers in our ability to understand and protect the ocean's delicate ecosystems. But as we think about the future, I think it's clear that the health of our oceans is intricately linked to the health of our planet. So how will the innovations and strategies discussed today shape the next chapter in our fight against climate change? And what role can each and every one of us play in supporting these efforts? These are just a few of the questions we can explore together. Remember, email me techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Love to hear from you on this. But as always, thank you for joining me on this journey beneath the waves today. And until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, but more importantly of all, work together in creating a more sustainable future. Speak with you all bright and early tomorrow. Bye for now. 